Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your presence. Thank you, Father, for the reminder tonight in this song that we need you. We need you, Lord. We need you. And we thank you that that need is fulfilled over and over abundantly and more than we can even think or imagine. <clears throat> so, Father, we just thank you for what it is that you want to share tonight. I thank you that you have brought every person sitting in this pavilion out here and online you have brought here us here for a reason, for a purpose. Father, what is that word that you have for us that's going to fill our hearts because we need you? And so, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, would you allow our hearts to be wide open? Would you give us ears to hear that faint whisper of yours that just pierces our heart in a way that satisfies the longing of our soul? And Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word heals our soul. And uh, Father, we just praise you. We glorify you. We give you our, our uh, hearts tonight to do what it is that you want to do. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, thanks for being here tonight. I'm hoping that it's all good online. I don't know. I'm like doing old school with my phone. So listen, who needs high tech when you got a phone, right? Uh, how's everyone's summer going? Yeah. I can't believe it's already mid-July. It's craziness. And this is fun being able to be outside. You okay over there, Susan? Yeah, I'm saving worms. Saving worms. Saving worms. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. <clears throat> um, so I'm, I've been praying about where I was going to start. And as we get into this tonight, can you all hear me back there okay? Okay. And uh, I think I wanted to start with a message that the Lord's been putting on my heart regarding oil. And why that's important to us, what that means, what's this whole thing with oil? Why do we keep hearing about this word called anointing? What does that even mean? What about the Holy Spirit? What, is, what does that have to do with my everyday life? And what does it have to do with my troubled marriage? And what does that have to do with this trial? What does that have to do with this storm? And what does that have to do with this medical thing? And what does it have to do with this wandering child? Like what, what does that have to do when I'm reading about God's anointing and I'm reading about this oil? Hi, Marianne. Come on in. You're fine. See, that's the beautiful thing about it being a small, little, intimate group. You can just come on in. We just started. Uh, and so I want to just begin with asking you, you don't have to raise your hand, but I would be interested. How many of you came in this evening, just sitting here, how many of you feel somewhat stressed? Okay, so 99.9% .9 of you. <laughs> Uh, we laugh about it, but it, it is a reality, isn't it? Living in the culture and the world with trials and tribulations and perversion and darkness and just real life issues, it causes stress. And I remember uh, my son was in a, some of you know this story, but not so long ago, a few summers ago, he was in a, a boat, it was a fishing boat, on uh, Lake St. Clair, which can be a very big lake with tumultuous like waves that are very dangerous, right? And unbeknownst to them, there is a stress fracture in the boat. And it just took one more wave to just catapult right into that stress fracture that caused that boat to drown. Literally, it sank. And that's why the stress that we experience, whether it's a stress fracture of a broken bone, you know, I've had it before where we've had, you know, children, you probably experienced that in your own life or even in your own body, you've had a stress fracture and what do they do? They cast you up immediately so that doesn't get worse, right? It's an indication and they make you cease. They stop that, that arm or that leg or whatever it is from movement because there is a stress fracture so that it can heal. And what I want to just share with each one of you tonight is maybe just maybe because of the stress that 99.9% .9 of you are experiencing, and I'm, there, I'm right there with you, that God is asking us to be still, to put, be almost like be put in a cast tonight so that he can come in and he can repair that. That stress fracture is an indication. It's just a signal. It's a symbol that something could be disastrous if we keep moving ahead. The stress fracture doesn't mean necessarily that what you're doing in life is wrong. It just means maybe the way that we're going about it isn't the right way. And that's what I really want to start talking to you about. I was feeling a, a great amount of stress, and uh, the Lord kept saying to me this week, 
you need to cease. You, we need to cast you, your soul for a moment. And I want you to come away with me for a couple days. And um, so I did that. I went by myself and I had a couple days away where I just needed to hear from him, hear something about clarity, about something specific that was going on in my life. And I was adamant, I, I don't want to leave here till I hear from you. And I know that you are a God who speaks and I know you are a God who delivers and I know you are a God who heals and I'm desperate for that for this particular situation. It doesn't mean that he's going to like zap it and make it, you know, the, it, he does do miracles. But more than that, the, the, the miracle is his presence, his nearness, his witness, his word, that number you see, that feather that you just find right there on the floor that I found when I got here today. Because I'm like, Lord, I need to know that this is what you want tonight. He's been, he's been showing himself to be so faithful over and over and over again. And that's what I'm really wanting for every one of you tonight, to not necessarily just be intrigued by with what human words I have, but like the Holy Spirit is experienced and felt and just covered over every single one of you in a new and fresh and beautiful way, right? Who doesn't want that, right? And that's where that stress fracture begins to be, begin healed this evening, from being in this place because all of you could be doing and even online all of if I'm even going through I do not know but I hope to, I hope we are but but all of you could be doing many other things but yet you chose to be here tonight you chose to settle in you chose for him to come and heal that which is being stressed right now and so that very thing that's stressing you out bring that to the forefront of your heart and your mind tonight and bring that before the lord as we begin to speak his word we're going to bible nerd it out tonight anyone ready to bible nerd it out because sometimes we sometimes i want to just come here and deliver a message and make it easy for everybody but the lord's like that really doesn't do us any good and so this is a really safe place i know that makes it used to make me nervous and it still does when i'm at church because as many times as I have read his word, I still don't know the books, the order of the books. I still scramble. So there's no shame, like none, to go to the front of your Bible and look it up where it's at. We're just going to take our time because what I want you to see is that when God gives a message, it all matches each other, all 66 books of the Bible. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily like just put, you know, say something here and it doesn't make any sense here. It's like this beautiful puzzle that comes together. And that's what I want to do tonight. I want us to be these puzzle piece makers tonight. And we just take this from the Old Testament. We take this from the New Testament. It, and all of a sudden we step back and we see this most beautiful picture that you can't just get from one scripture verse. You know, it's just not enough for like a verse a day to keep the devil away. God's like, no, that's not what it's about. I want you just to come and hang by my vine this, e this evening. And so that's what we're going to do. Does that sound good? Okay. So I want to start uh, Matthew 25, 14. Let's just get right into it. So Matthew is in the New Testament, if, if, if you're unfamiliar with it. So listen, girls, I'm cheating because I went ahead when I got home this afternoon from my parents' house. And I'm like, because I don't, I, I scramble. I did do this. I'm going to help you out. But if you go to, so it's Matthew right after the book of, um, after, well, actually Malachi of the Old Testament. So Matthew 25, 14, give me an amen when you find it. Amen. Oh, you girls are good. I'm, I'm really impressed. Okay, so Matthew 25, 14. This is a story where Jesus is trying to tell people, like, what is it like, the kingdom of heaven? What is it like, right? And so he describes it. I'm going to just read it out loud. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man that's going on a long trip. He called together his servants and he entrusted his money. The original translation actually says talents. So he, he, but it's also, they believe it's probably he's referring to money, but we're going to call it talents tonight. He entrusted his talents to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of talent to one, two bags of talent to another, and one bag of talent to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. He said no more. He gave them the talents and he left. Okay. So then we move on to verse 16. He says this. So the servant who received the, the five bags of silver began to invest the, the, the talent and he earned five times more, 100% back. The second servant, right, got man number two. He had two bags of silver or talent and he also went to work and he earned two more, another 100%. But the servant who received one bag of talent, he dug a hole in the ground and he hid the master's talent. He hid the master's talent. And so this is really where I want to start with us tonight. 
is that this evening, as we come together, I'm asking the Lord what he wants me to exactly share as he gives me this verse. But he's given every single one of us this beautiful gift. So we saw Tia use her gift of music this evening, right? We all have extreme, beautiful, treasured, unfathomable, incomprehensible gifts that God has given just you that are very different than the ones that he's given me. And I find it so interesting here in this example because this is God who's gone on this long trip. Basically, Jesus is using this man and it's really God. And he's talking to his servants. Back in the day when Jesus is giving this example, you would have never had a master give his slaves. The original translation says slaves, not servants. But you would have never had them give, give them any kind of uh, money or talent or any type of resource. They would have given it to their children. They would have given it to a beneficiary. They would have given it to a, a relative. But never, the greater never found the lesser. The lesser always had to go find the greater. In the rabbis of that first century Jesus culture, the, the lesser always had to go find the greater. The lesser always had to go find the teacher. The student always had to go search out the teacher until Jesus came in. He flipped everything right side up and Jesus went and found the lesser. The greater went and found the lesser. The teacher went and found the students. Remember he found Matthew straight up in his sin at the tax, at the tax booth. He went and found the woman at the, at the well. I mean, we can go over and over. He sought them, he chased them, even the prodigal son. He still wasn't believed he was worthy of God and he was trying to think of excuses and the father saw him a long ways off. He pulled up his dress and literally ran and they didn't run at that time. He ran after his son. He hadn't even confessed, repented, none of it yet. He's running after him. This is the father that's chasing after you tonight. He is running after you. You don't have to run after him. He's finding you. He goes to the one like we know, right? He leaves the 99 to go find the one. Christy McMillan loves to say that she's watched these sheep. She's, she's done these Israel trips over and over and over again. And I get to go with her in October and I can hardly stand it. You're going to get so sick of hearing me talk about it. So I rub it in your face. But she observes this and the one sheep that does wander away, because we've talked about the wandering before, it's so easy to wander, isn't it? It's so easy to wander when we're knee deep in fear. It's so easy to wander when we're knee, near, knee deep in concern and fret and worry and anxiety and depression and, and maybe something good. Maybe it's like things that are going our way. It's a good job. It's a, it's a new relationship. And it's like it's the focus of our life. And we're grazing on this new thing, this new grass, this worry, this fear, this anxiety. And we're just grazing. And we look up. We're like, how did I end up here? And she says that when that sheep happens to finally realize that they have grazed away from their father's care and their father's flock and their father's security, they don't go running after their father, going running after their shepherd. No, they hunker down and they call out they, this voice that the shepherd recognizes. And the shepherd goes and finds the sheep. Because that's what a good daddy does. That's what a good shepherd does. That's what our father is doing for us. You just hunker down. I don't know where you're at in your life right now, but wherever you're at, you just hunker down and you just call out your father's name and he comes chasing after you. We know this is to be biblically accurate. This isn't to tickle our ears. We don't do that here. This is biblically accurate. We see this over and over and over again. Yes, even in the Old Testament, the, our God was relentless for his people relentless in the face of, of their idolatry, relentless in the face of their, of their waywardness, relentless in the face of their in, uh, being just not content, he would continuously pursue them and beg them because he knew that the very things that they were engaging in, it wasn't because they broke a rule, but it was breaking them, right? And so that's what God is after at this particular story. So I just find it so intriguing that he's making sure to say, as I can just imagine the people that are listening to him like, what do you mean? What kind of story are you telling Jesus? Like, what are you talking about? A master gave talents, gave money to the, to the slaves. That, does, that doesn't happen. And so as we move forward, if you notice, there were three men, correct? Three women, three people. And the first one got hold of the talent. And by instinct, Holy Spirit instinct, what did he do? Do you guys remember? What did he do? Doubled it. Doubled it. The second person, what did he do? doubled it. The third person, what did he do? Buried it. Buried it. <laughs> and if you, I don't know if I read that part yet, and we're going to read it in a moment. Let's just read it now. So right there in verse 19, it says this. So after a long time, their master returned from his trip and he called them to give an account of how they used his talent, his money. 
The servant to whom he had trusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been, does that sound familiar? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Take note of those words because those are the words that we read later on in Revelation when we're face to face with him. It's not going to be Colleen with me. It's not going to be my mom with me. It's not going to be my brother and sister with me. It's going to be me and my father. I am the only one I, that, I, that is held accountable to what I do, what I think, where I go, what I say, who I serve. It's just me and him. And those words that we want to hear at the end of the day, it's not from our perfection. In fact, it's far from it. It's what we're going to be talking about tonight. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the oil that we're going to be, it's the anointing we're going to be talking about. He said, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I'm going to give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward. Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I have earned two more. The master says again, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling uh, this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate. However, in verse 24, then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, now listen to this. I knew you to be a harsh man. Do you see the difference here? He didn't know the character of God. He was believing a lie from the enemy of the character of God. Do you see why it's so important that we know who God is and what he's like? This is why on the morning Bible studies, like it was probably getting ridiculous how many times we mentioned it. Well, we got to know who God is and what he's like, because if we start to believe the enemy, we will believe that God is harsh. And so when we believe God is harsh, this is how we'll respond to the very talent that he has given us. He said, I believe that you are a harsh man, harvesting crops that you don't plant and gathering crops that you didn't cultivate. Verse 25, I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. Do you see that word? I was, I was afraid. I was afraid. It was a fear because he didn't know the character, the love, the faithfulness, the goodness, the security, the transcendency, the intimacy, the nearness, the witness, the closeness of his father. The other two, they, they didn't say that. They knew the character of their father. So by instinct, because of the Holy Spirit that was in them, they're given a gift from God. And by instinct, God never said this to them. They multiplied it. Because God is a multiplier. Remember when he took, was it, was it the two fish and five, or is it two, five loaves, two fish? He multiplied it. The woman in the Old Testament, in the book of either 1 Kings or 2 Kings, she had just one oil. What happened? The prophet came in there and God through the prophet multiplied it. We see God as a multiplying God. And so that same God is the same God that lives and resides in us. So when he gives us something, he multiplies it. But when we are not attached to the vine, when we don't have this oil that we're going to be talking about constantly in our life, hanging by the vine that we're all doing this evening, we are not going to have the Holy Spirit instinct to multiply that which he has given you. Tonight, every one of you, like I said just about 15 minutes ago, you have a very gift and a very calling in a person that the person next to you does not have. But the person next to you right now, she's a miracle. She's a survivor. And every person that you look in the eyes of, that daughter is a miracle. That sister next to you is a survivor. Don't ever see them in any other light. I don't care how sinful they are. I don't care how smelly they are. I don't care how messy they are. I don't care the label that you've heard, the reputation you've heard on her. That woman is a miracle and that woman is a straight up survivor. And that's how we see her. Because when that person hears you tell them that and reminds them of their very calling on their life, they're going to have the audacity to go out and live what God has predestined for them. But when we have this lie about who God is, we will hide the very talent. I was just in the car with my son yesterday. He's 17. And this boy, he I'm not kidding, girls. When he was born, he came out, he started to hum. I, I would say he was like six days old. And he started to hum right on tune. This, this one song, I'm not going to even try to do it because I can't. But I'm like, he's on tune. He can sing. So, you know, my other two kids, they can't. They're not on tune, so that's not, that's not saying. But this one can sing. And so I watched it as he was growing up, and I made sure to always tell Jess you got a talent that God alone has given you. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. So I got him in everything we could, music-wise. And, and he was doing, you know, rock bands and fun things and doing things at church. And all of a sudden, he hit a certain age. He hit, actually, his puberty. And he's like, I can't sing anymore. So I just had a conversation with him yesterday because I was driving in the car with him. And he starts to sing. I haven't heard him sing in two years. And he starts to sing out loud. 
to Brown Eyed Girl, you know that song, come on now, who can't belt out Brown Eyed Girl? <laughs> We're both belting it out, but I'm listening, I'm like, man, this boy can sing. And so it gave me an opportunity as his face is turning kind of flush, you know, and I'm like, Jesse, you've got a gift. God's giving you a gift. Don't waste that gift. That gift is supposed to bring other people into his glory. That gift is supposed to reveal how awesome our God is. He has given you that gift. Don't, don't, don't hide it. Like go use it for his good, for his glory. Use this gift, you know? And so he's acting like, because that's what teenage, teenagers do. They act like they're not hearing you, but, but he's hearing me. And we need to be that for one another when we see that gift in each other, right? That gift of encouragement, that, that gift of hospitality, that gift of teaching, that gift of prophecy, that whatever gift that is, ask God to illuminate it for you of people you have just met so that you can call it out and then remind them the character of God. No, he's not a harsh God. No, he's a kind God. And when we develop that relationship with our Father and knowing his character, we will no longer reside and, and establish ourselves in fear. I heard a, a speaker say this when I was gone this week. I was listening to a bunch of just podcasts and stuff, and this man just spoke this word about something else, but I thought it was so relatable to this. He said, listen, we need to learn to um, expose our talent and bury our fear. But so oftentimes we've got that reversed where we're exposing our fear and we're burying our talent. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just wondering tonight if that's happening in your life. This is the thing, we're going to feel fear. I happen to experience that probably more than the average person. It just happens to be a limitation on my end. But God's like, no, we're gonna flip that because we will feel the emotion of fear, but the spirit of fear is what keeps you stagnant. The spirit of fear is what keeps you hiding that talent. The spirit of fear is what keeps you just in a safety fetal position on the bottom of a boat. And, and Jesus has come to break you free from that spirit of fear. I see y'all looking somewhere. Okay. It's Lauren. Come on, Lauren. Come on, girl. I'm like a bag lady. That's all right. <laughs> we'll take it. And it's Aria. I love it. Come on in, girls. Here. We're here. Woo, woo. Okay. Uh, so, okay, with that being said, is that making sense to everyone? Yeah? You guys receiving that? Mm-hmm. Hopefully feeling encouraged by that? Okay, good. So let's move on. Let's go to John sixteen seven. So if you're in Matthew, it's, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just a few books over to the right of the end of the Bible. We're going to go to Matt, John, I'm sorry, John 16. John 16, 7. All right, let me know if you got it. Amen? Okay. John 16, 7 says this. This is Jesus talking in red letters. But in fact, this is right before he goes to the cross. Okay, girls, he says this. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come but if I do go away then I will send him to you okay so that 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 word advocate it's the Holy Spirit it's also known as uh, I looked it up in the in the in the Greek because the New Testament is written in Greek the Old Testament Hebrew it says that he's it's the Holy Spirit that he's referring to with the advocate he's your intercessor he's your comforter he's your helper he's your consoler Right? He's, he's, he's all of those things. He's your power. He's the one who administers God's love. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. He's saying, you can't have this advocate. You can't have this consoler. You can't have this comforter. You can't have this dunamis power in your life if I don't first go away. And then so if we go on two chapters, you don't have to go to this one, but just in John 18, we see that, John, that Jesus is now in a garden. It's called the Garden of Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, it just means it's an oil press. Right? So he's saying in John 16, just stay with me. He's saying in John 16, I have to go away. I have to die so that you can receive this oil, this Holy Spirit, this comforter, this protector, this provider for your life. But I have to go away first. And so here we are two, chap- two, two chapters away in John 18. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26 talks more about it. And basically in, in, in this Garden of Gethsemane, which is an oil press, Jesus is praying and he prays three times. Some of you have heard me share this and I'm, so I'm not going to spend too, too long on it, 
But it's interesting because in this oil press that Jesus specifically chose to go to, he could have gone to any garden. He could have gone to any place. He could have gone to any mountain that he's familiar with. He specifically chose, and this is where I don't want us to miss this, he specifically chose the Garden of Gethsemane because he knew that he had to be pressed. He knew that he had to be crushed for the oil to come out. And so he's literally a stone throw. It's probably where, from what they say, it's probably like where these beautiful flowers are. He's actually looking at an oil press operation. He's surrounded by trees, uh, olive trees, that they take that and then they do, they do what they do to make the oil from the olives. So as he's praying, he's recognizing, it's like a direct reflection of what, and a depiction of what he's about to go through. He's about to be crushed. He's about to be pressed so that he can give you the oil. He's saying, I can't give you that oil until I'm first pressed, just like this oil press. So it's really significant that we don't gloss over, that we don't miss this part of Jesus's death on the cross and what he was providing for us, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is known as the anointing, as the oil. And so it's interesting because that number three, so they did in the, in the olive press, some of you know this, I'm just going to go over it again though. The olive press, there was three presses. Right? There was the first pressing that was pretty easy, and they got out the oil. And the second pressing, they had another like 500-pound weight, and these donkeys would go around all the olives just to get the rest of that oil out. But that third pressing, it was that third pressing that they had that last heavy um, piece of equipment that got out that last little bit of drip drop of the oil. And this particular oil was used for, so interesting, light and soap. The third pressing was light and soap. This is exactly why Jesus died, is to give us his light and also to give us his soap to cleanse us from all the sin stains that we have. It was the light and the soap of the oil. So it's interesting because Jesus prayed three times in the garden. He prayed, uh, three crosses were on uh, Golgotha. Uh, Jesus rose on the third day. Like three is such an important number. Three, it's mentioned, they say like over 480 times in the Bible. And the third person in the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. So stay with me on this number three, okay? So the third letter, I did, I really, I really nerded out this week, but the third letter in the Hebrew alphabet is, is, is this word called gimel. And it basically is associated with a camel because the way that it looks like in, in Hebrew, it looks like a camel. So they say number three is a lot like, a, they look at it as a camel and the meaning of the number three in the Hebrew alphabet means to nourish. And this is what the Holy Spirit does for us. It nourishes us. It provides for us. It gives us his love. Romans 5.5, 5, it says it ministers God's love. It nourishes your, your heart that just seems unsatisfied or parched or hungry right now. And so I looked a little bit more into that camel because it's really significant everywhere I looked about this number three representing the camel. And as we move forward, the camel, it's interesting because the camel had these long legs and it would carry people high up above this scorching heat of the sand in the desert, right? And so this, I was reading about this, this guy was saying, it's just like the Holy Spirit to do that. He's like, he rises you above the Holy Spirit's power, has the capability of rising us above the heat of the circumstances of the storms of our life that just seem like they're, they're about to burn us. And the Holy Spirit's like, no, I'm going to rise you above. I'm going to put you above that heat. It's almost like Isaiah 40, 31, where it says we soar on wings like eagles. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the gift of the oil. This is the gift of the anointing that during that storm and during that trial and during that suffering and during that, that fire, he's literally lifting you above it so that you come out of that, not even smelling like smoke, like the book of Daniel, because that's the power. That's the anointing. That's the protection. That's the sealment of the oil of the Holy Spirit. Y'all sticking with me? Okay. Okay. And then the second thing with the camel is that when the load is to be removed, so think about camels that are moving forward, right? They put all their burdens, all their luggage on these camels. So they're literally, they're just amazing animals. And they have all these baggages everywhere. But in order to get the bags off, Terry Miller has spoken about this before. The camel literally has to get on its knees and roll over so that the baggage can be dumped out. 
And we can only do that with the gifting of the Holy Spirit that prompts you like, listen, it's time for you to get flat on your knees. It's time for you to get on your side. It's time for you to rest. It's time for you to come here tonight to Barn 45 and cease from the stress and cease from the strain, the burdens that you may have brought in here this, this tonight and even today when I was here earlier, like the, the stuff that I've brought in, it's like the Lord's like, listen, it's time to stop. It's time to get onto your knees. It's time to roll over and it's time to give me your baggage. This is the power of the Holy Spirit's prompting in our life. You can't do it standing up. The camel can't release the baggage standing up. It can't release the baggage moving. Camels love to move. They do not like to oftentimes stop is what I was reading. But there's a time to stop. I often love to use this this, this, um, analogy, but like that fan we're moving right now at a high speed, you would not see the gaps in it. But as soon as it stops, right, we see all the gaps between the blades. And that's oftentimes in our life. It's like, if I can just keep moving, if I can just keep busy, maybe just maybe the ghosts that I feel like are chasing me down, I won't have to see them. I won't have to see that there's actually gaps in my life that I have to face. And God's like, no, listen, with the Holy Spirit, with the anointing, with the oil, you can face them. We've got this. It's time for you to get onto your knees, get onto your side, and let the baggage be rolled over unto me. And that's really where I want to encourage a lot of us as we move forward in tonight's teaching. I don't know where you're at in your own personal journey, but I I would encourage you, bless you. No, it's okay. I would encourage you, make this part of, and not in a behavior way, but in a new heart posture way. Make this part of your everyday life, of coming before your father like a camel, And just getting onto your knees with him and releasing that baggage, releasing that weight, releasing that burden and giving it to him and letting him take that from you daily because the enemy is going to want you to pick that back up and put it right back on your back and get moving. It's going to be an intentional thing. It's going to be an everyday thing. It's going to require having people with you that are holding you accountable. It's worth the fight. It's going to be a fight, but it's, it's, it's worth the fight. And then they were saying that camels consume large amounts of water to preserve it through the desert. That's why just Sunday to Sunday doesn't cut it. I tried it. It doesn't work. Because Monday through Saturday, I'm a hot mess. This is why communal disciple, that discipleship that we do here each day, or even on your own, where Jesus is like, listen, you got to get away, shut the door, get into a secret place with me, get into that pasture like the camel and give me your burdens. Come to me and I want to give you rest. My burden is light, right? He's like, I want to take that from you every single day of your life, not in a behavior modification way, but in a save my life type of way, because I have nothing to give anybody if I don't first come before you, Father. You made me. You know what I need today. You know what I need to give to you today. I have no business going out into this world without first being ambushed by you. Tell me what it is that I need from you. We oftentimes say, I don't know what phone call I'm going to get in the afternoon, right? We don't know what's going to happen, but God does. He knows exactly every single millisecond of your day tomorrow, tonight, and the second that you get back into your car tonight. But I'm going to tell you, all of hell is going to be nervous when we get back in our car tonight. (laughs) Because we are being fed truth this evening and being reminded this this is a daily discipleship with our Father God of receiving the anointing, the oil of the Holy Spirit that we're going to talk a little bit more. And so, uh, We talked about, if you want to move to Genesis 28, all the way, the very first book of Genesis. And some of you that have been part of our Bible study, this is going to be a little bit familiar to you. But you remember the very first time that we hear about uh, oil being poured over anything, like what is this about, was in Genesis 28 with Jacob. Mm -hmm. And he is, uh, if if you go there for a moment, I'm not going to read it out loud, but basically I'm just going to share the story with you. Some of you are very familiar with it, but Jacob, right? He's, he's, he's all alone. He's in a wilderness. He's like, what is going on? I'm fearful. I'm a mama's boy. My mom is not with me. I don't know where you're taking me. I wonder how many of you are in that right now, right? Just in the wilderness season. I'm not sure. I know where I left, but I'm not sure where I'm going. I'm not sure what you're up to, God. It just, nothing seems right right now. Everything just seems quite upside down, uncertain, fear-based. And that's where Jacob is. 
And so Jacob takes this rock, right? And, he, and he's like, I think he's probably just like, this is how I feel. I'm going to put my head on this as a, as a pillow. And it's this big old rock and he's uncomfortable. And this rock is not giving him an, a good night's sleep. You know, and this is where I want us to personalize it because this is really where we learn to read the word is making it so personal. Yes, we ask God who you are and then it becomes a mere reflection in our own life. What is it that's waking you up in the middle of the night? What rock do you have right now in your life? That you're waking up at two, three, four, five, six in the morning because that rock is uncomfortable, because that rock is irritating you. What is your rock? You don't have to say it out loud, but right now I, w- I would just encourage you, like, bring that to the Lord right now in your heart. Like, here's, okay, Lord, you know the rock that I'm dealing with. Here's the rock. Well, this is very similar to what Jacob was experiencing. This rock was uncomfortable. This rock was waking him up. Well, in this evening of his head on this rock, he has this dream where he sees this staircase that goes from the ground to heaven, and he sees angels ascending and descending, and he literally sees the glory of God on top of this glorious ladder that reaches heaven and God speaks to him in a beautiful way in a way that he would have spoken to the two people that took the talents and they knew what to do with the talents because they did knew that God was not a fearful God that God was not a harsh God but they knew God was a good God he saw God in that way he no longer saw God in the harsh way you know that longer, longer saw God in a fearful way and he saw and heard God say I'm with you I've got you and that hearing that he was always with him, hearing that he's, he's going to be always near him and he's going to protect him, he says in, in, in Genesis 28. He then wakes up the very next morning, first thing in the morning, and he pours this oil over the rock. He anoints the rock, the very thing that was disturbing his sleep, the very thing that was uncomfortable in his life. He ends up anointing that very thing, that very trouble, that very heartache, that very relationship, that very storm that you're maybe experiencing right now. He anoints it with the oil because the oil is saying, you are protecting me. This thing that the rock, that the enemy wanted to use against me, to harm me, to break me, you are using it to make me. So I'm pouring this oil to show that you are protecting me. I'm pouring, I'm showing this oil that you are providing for me because the Holy Spirit is the anointing. It's the oils. Are you guys keeping up with that? Is that making sense to you? Okay. So let's move, let's move forward just so I can get off in time, but I really want to make sure you all get this um, in, in your being as we move forward. Matthew, let's go on to Matthew 25. Uh, verse 1 through 13. So go back to Matthew, that very first book in the New Testament. Let me know when you got it. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Got it? Got it, got it. Okay. Okay, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. This is what it reads. In the, and I'm reading from the NLT. It says, then the kingdom of heaven, okay, so Jesus is again describing what the kingdom of heaven is like. He's like, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Well, why was five foolish and why were five wise, right? It's an interesting question. The five who were foolish, they didn't have enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five who were wise enough to take along extra oil. So when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Well, at midnight, they were roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming, right? Christ is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up, prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our our lamps are going out. But the others replied, the wise replied, We don't have enough oil for you. Go to a shop and buy some. So while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside the door calling, Lord, Lord, please open this door. But he called back, and this is a harsh word from Jesus, but he called back, believe me, I don't know you. This is how significant, those are some harsh words. This is how significant it is about knowing the oil from the Holy Spirit. 
having the oil of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk to you more about what that even means, what that even looks like. But he is like, if you are unattached to my vine that we're going to talk about, if you do not have this oil, you don't even know me. It's a pretty it's a pretty severe word, but as we move forward, it's going to make a little bit more sense. Okay, now let's get into this book. This book, we don't hear much about it, but you guys, this one rocked my world this week. First Thessalonians 5:19. Okay, it's near the back of your Bible. Um, it's right, it's kind of by 2 Corinthians, Colossians, then it's Thessalonians. Find Colossians. So you got Galatians, Ephesians. This is all near the back of your Bible. Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Did you find it? Okay, I love this book. I don't know why we don't talk about this book more often. But uh, everyone good? Everyone got it? You're starting to feel like a Bible nerd. Isn't this fun going through the Bible like this? Okay. So, and if, you know, feel free to highlight this, underline this. If you've got a Bible that you, that you just borrowed tonight, keep it, underline it. It's worth it. But 1 Thessalonians 5.19, let's read that out loud. Let me find it. Okay. It says this, do not stifle. Uh, in other words, do not quench the Holy Spirit period. Like just don't quench, don't stifle the flow of the Holy Spirit. We, we have the ability to do that. If you think about, um, in fact, at this very moment, I have a plumber at my house in the bathroom. That's why I was taking the call from my son because our faucet's not working. It's not pouring out when you open up the, the left handle, the heat, the water's not coming out the way it should. It's so much like in our own life. When we're stifling the Holy Spirit, when we're grieving the Holy Spirit, when we're quenching the Holy Spirit, it should be like this river just pouring through us. It comes from him through us and throughout other people. But when we're stifling it, when we're quenching it, when we're grieving the Holy Spirit, it's like a little drip. drop. There's a clog in your heart. There's a clog in your system. And oftentimes that clog is the very thing that that camel is holding onto because he refuses to bow down, lean over, get some rest, and give his father what's needed. It's the burdens. It's the lies from the enemy. It's the pollution from the world. It's the fear from this culture that we live in. It's the unknowns for tomorrow that cause such great anxiety. It's the should ofs, the would ofs, the could ofs that's in the blockage system of your heart and that spirit, the Holy Spirit is trying to come through like this wave, like this tidal wave out. But it's this little drip drop because we're clogged. And I'm telling you, there's some beautiful spiritual draino that God wants just to dump straight into your heart to unclog you this evening. He wants to take every one of those burdens, every one of those lies from the enemy, every one of those should ofs, could ofs. And let me tell you, your failures, they will teach you just as much as your successes. Don't let those failures mess you up. That's where the enemy gets me so much. Like, oh, you did that again. You said that again. You thought that again. Like, what are you thinking? And it's like, no, no. These failures that I have done, that I have engaged in, that I have went to, that I have just, yep, I messed up because I'm human again. They will teach me probably even more than my successes because God's, God is so good to come in so gently, so kindly and flip that right side up. And so we're learning here that when we give him that, you know, that flow comes through, but when we're unattached from his vine, it says that we can do nothing, right? So I want to go, I want to go to that. So go to John 15, 1 through 5. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So back to the left a little bit from where you're at. And make sure you keep that first Thessalonians, because I want you to read that this week. I just love that book. John 15. Let me know when you get there, because I think you're beating me. John 15, 1 through 5. Everyone there? Okay, awesome. Okay, I'm going to read this out loud. This is what it says. I am the true grapevine. Okay, so who's talking right now? That's right. So he's saying he's the vine. Jesus is the vine. He says, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. So remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. 
Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. nothing. Apart from him, you can do nothing. This is why that third man, that third person didn't do nothing. Because he wasn't attached to the vine. He didn't have the Holy Spirit telling him, multiply, giving him the gifts and the talents and the resources that supersede what his own human ability is able to do. We cannot multiply on our own. It is only through the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. It is only through the knowledge and the witness and the presence right, of, of the Holy Spirit that provides us to be able to do things that we could never do, accomplish things that we could never accomplish, think things that we could never think, say things that we could never say, have favor of things that we should never have favor over. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way that we can multi multiply it. And I find it interesting. I think in most translations, at least in mine, it says remain five times. And I love that because, again, I'm going to nerd out a bit, but five is a really significant number. He's like, remain in me, remain in me, remain in me. Like It's, it's almost, almost funny how repetitive it is. And it's such a good, good father to tell us over and over and over again, like, remain in me because I know this world that you live in. It's going to be so easy to not remain in me. It's going to be so easy just to go to church on Sundays, just to go to that Bible study. But it's, it's going to be take intentionality. It's going to take a fight. It's going to take some gumption. It's going to take you getting up and like, no, I'm going to tell the enemy where to go today. That type of mentality. Because of my weakness, his strength is being put on a platform for all to see. Like it's going to take that type of tenacity and perseverance and endurance to rise up. And that rising up is actually humbling yourself, falling to your knees and letting him have your luggage and your baggage. And so that number five in the Hebrew language is the letter H. And that means it just means grace. It's like grace upon grace is what that means. And so I'm like, okay, so you say it five times remain in this grace. And that, that word Yahweh, like we know his, we know his name Yahweh, right? It's Y-H-W-H. This grace is intermingled in his name every time you breathe because Yahweh is just your breath. It's breathing in, it's breathing out, right? We've learned that this year. That's his name. So every time you breathe, which is 22,000 times a day, you're actually declaring not only that God is the great I am, who God is, but you're also declaring grace upon grace upon grace upon grace because of those letter H's, right? That is a fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so, okay, so I love this. So we have got God. Who's God in this story? Who does it say God is? The gardener, the gardener right. Okay, so just, I wish I had a blackboard or a whiteboard out here. So we got God as the gardener. Who's Jesus? The vine. Yes. So if God's the gardener, we got Jesus as the vine. Just picture this in your mind. I'm the what? I'm the branch, right? I'm the branch. And the Holy Spirit is the sap. Picture that sap. You need that sap to go from the vine to the branches to, to provide all the nourishment. Remember at the very beginning, we talked about what that actually means. It's the Hebrew, remember that Hebrew letter that looks like a camel? It means nourishment. The Holy Spirit is this nourishment. Is that making sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. So the sap that we see is actually like the Holy Spirit within us. And when the branch is taken away from the vine, that nourishment is no longer given. Does that make sense? It's no longer given to the branch. We can do nothing without the Holy Spirit sap from the vine to the branch. And then I started to think about this beautiful thing. So God's the gardener. Jesus is the vine. The Holy Spirit is the sap. I'm the branch. But if you look at, a, I started looking up pictures of like a vineyard. We went to um, Traverse City recently, you know, and you got vineyards everywhere. And um, they all are held up by a trellis, right? You're the trellis. His people are the trellis for each other. Otherwise, if we don't have one another, if we don't have community like this, we're just going to fall down. We won't grow properly. We need one another to hold each other up. And as soon as I started thinking about that on my ride home yesterday from where I was, I'm like, wow, you know, Lord, like that's exactly what it was for Moses. We got Moses back in the day in the book of Exodus, and he's on the mountain. He's looking down, and his, 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 his nation is in a war with another nation. And every time he kept his hands up, they would win. They would prevail but he's human. He can only do so much. And as soon as his hands would fall, the nation that he's watching below, they would be conquered. 
So his friends, Aaron, um, yeah, Aaron and Yur, H-U-R is his name, they would come up and they would, one would hold this hand up for him and one would hold this hand up for him because he could not do it on his own. But then they take it one step further and they bring a rock, a solid rock for Moses to sit on. That's exactly what we are to do for one another. We hold each other's hands up. We are the trellis, but also God's like, it's not enough just to be the trellis. You need to give that person, give that friend of yours, give that sister, give that BFF, give that whatever family member, give them a rock to sit on, a solid rock, because I am the rock. Give them me so that they have me to sit on. Isn't that cool? I just love that part about the Moses story about what we are to, to be to one another. And then, okay, so let's keep going. Y'all still okay? Okay, we're getting near the end, but I want to just make sure we got this. 2 Timothy 3, 5, you want to open up to that. So 2 Timothy is going to be to the right of where we're at right now. 2 Timothy 3, 5. All right, tell me amen when you got it. Okay. Anybody not there yet? I'll wait. 2 Timothy 3, 5 is kind of near the end. And this is the best place to get used to doing this, you know, being uncomfortable with not finding and fidgeting through your word. It's really a beautiful place to do that. So I'm glad that we can do that together. Okay, so 2 Timothy 3, 5 says this. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Oh, this is this is a severe word. Stay away from people like that. They are not attached to the vine. They have appearance of godliness, my trans an ESV translation says, but they deny its power. Avoid such people. Because unattached to the vine, we can do nothing. So true godliness is not just your talents, it is not just your gifts. That's not enough. True godliness is letting that sap from the vine to the branch ignite you, nourish you, provide for you, seal you, give you power, give you provision, give you protection, you know, give you this, this, this thinking of, of what, how the Holy Spirit thinks. We take on his thoughts, right? The sap is essential for us to be able to do what God has equipped us to do. Gifting and talent never trump fruit. Never. There can be no fruit when you are not attached to the vine. And that is the one thing that God is after the most in your life, sitting here this evening. He wants you to bear fruit, period. But in the culture that we live in, we really look for the talent. We really look for the gifts more than we do for the fruit. But Jesus has said all throughout the word, he's like, no, no, gifting and talent, they never trump the fruit. It's the fruit I'm after because you can have gifts and you can have talent and you can, you can be like that third person that's got talent, but they don't know how to multiply it because they don't have the spirit. They're not attached to the vine. And so tonight, what I want to just encourage you, this is the time, the resting time, maybe that stress fracture that you came in and like God's casting us all tonight to be still, right? To be in a safe place together. So that stress fracture doesn't turn into destruction and your boat goes under, right? That this is the time to recognize, Lord, you're just wanting me to hang by the vine. I, I can cease from the striving and from the straining and trying to be perfect and trying to get this right, and try to work this out, try to control this situation. And we've got all these, we're, as women, we're really good at doing that with lots of different plates. But God is saying, listen, all I'm wanting for you in this season of your life, just today, tomorrow's another day, we'll worry about itself. But for today, I want you to find me. I want you to hang by my vine. I want you to park your roots so deep in me because it's only there that fruit can be produced. We cannot produce fruit on our own. We, we know that, right? Like a tree that is not attached to the vine, it can't produce apples. It can't produce any kind of fruit. It's all being attached to the vine because we need that Holy Spirit oil, that sap that is going from the vine to the branches. And so let's move forward in Psalm 133, 1 through 2. How you doing online? Y'all with me still? I love it. Okay, Psalm 133. I don't think there's a more beautiful sound than that sound. <laughs> right? I just, I just love it. I just love it. So it says this, uh, if you're there, Psalm 133, one through two, it says, how wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters, they live together in harmony. 
For harmony is as precious as anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head and ran down his beard. So basically we're seeing here that when we live in harmony, when we live in unity with brothers and sisters, there's a protection. The Holy Spirit is like this oil of protection, right? So let's just move forward for a moment. Just hear me out on this. So there's harmony and unity, and it allows this oil to drip all over us. This is why the enemy comes into the churches, comes into your family, comes into your ministries, comes into your barn, and tries to cause disharmony, tries to cause disunity, tries to cause gossip, tries to cause whatever, havoc. He's great at that. Assumptions, whatever it might be, because he knows that that will cause the Holy Spirit, like that oil no longer is that provision, no longer is that covering. And so the oil, the Holy Spirit, when we're attached to the vine, the Holy Spirit oil provides protection. It provides, provides protection in your life. It's like the sealment. It's that cover. It's like Jacob pouring that oil over that rock. So there's a story. I cannot find it, but someone posted on the Bible nerd like a year or two ago, and I got to find it. But they were talking about there's a particular kind of, I believe, ox as an animal that when a predator comes near, there's, it secretes this oil. It goes out of it every pore so that when a predator tries to get its claws into that ox, it just literally slips off that animal. Do you remember reading this? It was yeah. just wild. It's the same in your life. You might not see that Holy Spirit oil all over you, but the enemy sees it. And he's trying to get at you and he's trying to put his claws in you, but he's literally slipping off because you've got the protection and the coating of the Holy Spirit that you might not be able to see with your human eyes, but in the spiritual realm, you are glossed over, my friends. But we're not if we're not hanging by the vine. We're not if we're not attached to the vine. We can do nothing. We are putting ourselves in harm's way when we think we can just go from Sunday to Sunday and live like the world. And he's like, I don't, it's not even about sins right now. It's nothing. Just come to me. Just abide in me. Because if you're not in me, you can do nothing. Remain, 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 remain in me. That's all I'm asking for you. Yup, you've got this addiction. Yup, you've got this stronghold. Yup, you've got this storm. Yup, you did it again. That's, that, I'll, I'll take care of that. That's just behavior stuff. Because once you abide in me, once you come to me, once you make this regular thought pattern that you're focusing on me because you know that I am the only way, I'm your only medication, I am the only antidote for all things broken, I will deal with this stuff. That'll naturally start to, to figure itself out. Such a good God, such a simple God. He's like, just come to me as you are. And when you come to me as you are, I'm going to serve some beautiful, delicious food at the table. I'm going to cook for you and I'm going to nourish you and I'm going to feed that heart that has been longing to be satisfied. That's why you've been engaging on those things because you found me though. You don't even want, those things aren't even going to be a temptation for you necessarily anymore. Yeah, you'll see them with your peripheral vision, but I'm going to be so much more beautiful when you're hanging by the vine, than this worldly counterfeit beauty. And so, okay, so it, oil provides protection. The Holy Spirit provides protection, but it also provides provision. If God has given you a vision, he's going to give you the provision. That's a rhymey rhyme. You'll never forget it. Take it to the bank. If you have a vision in here tonight, don't let the enemy quench that, stifle that, drown it out. God alone will give you the provision. What do you need to do? Hang by the vine. What do you need to do? Keep that sap going from the, from, from the very bottom of those roots all the way to your branch. That's it. If he's given you that vision, write it down and let him multiply it. Stay attached to the vine. If he's given you the vision, he will give you the provision. Number three, what does the Holy Spirit, what's that oil do? It gives you his presence, that manifest presence that I pray that y'all are experiencing as you're sitting here tonight. That's been my prayer since we started building this place. I think that's why we do really feel there are places that you experience the manifest presence of God. God's always with us, right? We know he's, he's omnipresent. He's always here. But there's that, those times, right, where like, you start crying. You're like, why am I crying? I got goosebumps. Why do I have goosebumps? It's because you felt the manifested presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I pray every person experiences that as we come onto his holy grounds. As you go into your secret prayer closet, I don't care if that's a bathroom, I don't care if that's a bathtub, you can feel that anywhere. That manifested presence. 
Romans 5, 5 talks about it. He says that you can't feel that manifested love, that manifested presence without the Holy Spirit. Your gifts and your talents won't bring it to you. You've got to be attached to the vine because it says in Romans 5, 5, it's one of my favorite verses, but all the verses are my favorite. <laughs> but right now it's my favorite. Romans 5, 5 says that it's the Holy Spirit. And listen to this word that pours God's love into your heart. Like not drip drop, like dumps it, dumps it. But you can't get that dumping of God's love if you're not attached to the vine, if you're not receiving that sap. If you're not getting that oil. And let me tell you, life is way too short to not get that dumping. I don't care how much you've done. I don't care. He doesn't care. I don't care either because I see you all as miracles. You all are gorgeous, beautiful. But what he sees when he sees you, it, I mean, mine pales in comparison. And he just wants to dump that over because you're going to be that camel that releases that stronghold, releases those burdens, releases those lies, releases those should have, releases those past, releases those labels, releases those worries and those frets. And then he gets to dump that all over you. And all you have to do, this is the simplicity of our father. And, and it messed with me for so long. When I, when I really got to know the father 13 years ago, I'm like, man, it can't be this simple. But it's really that simple, girls. Don't let the enemy overcomplicate it. It's like, no, just attach yourself to me. Will you mess up you still being attached to me? Yep, you will. But man, is he so quick to dust us off, put us back on that firm foundation and get you going because he's given you the vision. He's going to give you the provision. And then there's another one where, and, and number four, as I was just, just praying this week, he gave me some of these. It's power. The Holy Spirit gives us, I love this word. The Greek says it over and over again. It's a dunamis power. It's like comes from like the root word of dynamite. He gives you power to be able to do things that you normally wouldn't be able to do in your own human ability. That's that dunamis power that can only come from the Holy Spirit that you cannot get if you are not attached to the vine. Your talent and your gifts, they will not get you there. But when you humble yourself, that camel, right? You get in that position and you keep going to your father. That is where you're going to get power to do what you could never think that you could ever possibly do. There's power in your prayers. There's light that walks in a dark room. There is that light that beams out of you in, in a, you know, um, I was going to say target, but I'm, I don't know if we're still boycotting target. I am, but I mean, there's like, you know what I mean? Like there's power that illuminates out of you that you don't see the enemy. However, sees it and he trembles at it. He just doesn't want you to know that you've got doing his power. So he can keep, keep you convinced that you're just little old me sinful me. No, God calls you a saint. God calls you a priest. God calls you completely forgiven. God calls you holy and blameless in his sight. Like it's ridiculous what he sees when he looks at you because his blood has covered the sin that you have found yourself in when we confess and repent and offer it to him like that camel. All he's asking for you to do is what? Yep. And hang by and remain in him, abide in him, remain in him, and abide in him. It's really that simple. That's what I want to drill home for you this evening. I don't want you to ever forget tonight. Like, I want you to be sleeping tonight, and you have the words, remain in me, remain in me, remain in me. That's it. Stop looking at the sins. I know that sounds foreign, but just, just right now, just stop looking at the sin. Stop looking at that addiction, because there's going to be a time for that, and it's only through God's power that he's going to be able to break you free from that. You might be able to break free from it for a little bit with your own power, but you're just putting a Band-Aid on it. But to break free from that trial, that, or that, that could be a trial, but it could also be a habit. It could be a stronghold, whatever it might be. That mental thing that's going on in your mind, you don't know how to shut it off. The only way to break free from that indefinitely is through the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. How do we get the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit? Remain in him. It's that simple. It's that beautiful. I hope this is giving you some joy as we start to close this up. Um, okay, so 2 Corinthians 2.15, let's go to that. 2 Corinthians, we're going to go to the right. We're going to go back to the New Testament. It's going to be, you're going to find Romans, and then you're going to find 1 Corinthians, and then you're going to find 2 Corinthians. Everyone there? You guys are getting good. 
Everyone getting a little bit more comfortable, like opening up your word and finding it and stuff, right? Okay, 2 Corinthians 2.15. Can I go ahead and share that? Okay. Y'all doing okay on these hard seats? Okay, good. 2.15, it says, it says this. Make sure I'm on the right page here. Okay, our lives are a Christ-like fragrance, fragrance rising up to God, but... This fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. Hey, listen. Those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. Have you ever met somebody and it's like, you are a life-giving perfume to me? You have said the right thing. You have been in the right place. Your smile has just been like this fragrance. Leslie, today, when I got here, Bridget, when I got, I mean, you girls, Julie, when you, I got here, you were like this fragrance from me. I'm low on battery, so I hope I didn't lose y'all online, but he knows it. You have this dreadful smell. Now, this is so fascinating to me because hear me out on this one. There's actually birds, I think in general, most birds. I'm, I'm, so, I'm becoming a Bible nerd, but I kind of like get on Google and I love to look up animal stuff, you know, like what animals fascinate me. But it says that there's birds, they secrete an oil that smells bad when there's a predator that is coming their way because that predator smells that terrible odor. And it's like, no, I want nothing to do with that bird. That smell is so bad. It is the same thing. When you are attached to the vine, you smell beautiful to your sister next to you, but to the enemy, you are a stench. He's going to stay away from you because of the stench that is coming out. Is that making sense? Mm-hmm. It's like in my hotel room this week. I, what? It's awesome. Okay. And then Psalm, we're getting to near to the end. I love your patience. So thanks for bearing with me because I am just loving this um, study. Y'all doing okay? Psalm 23. Let's go to it. (laughs) Well, someone just posted it on the Bible nerd page and uh, I about lost my mind last night. This is why, because someone posted this, I knew I was supposed to teach this because this is where the Lord has had me in oil all week, two weeks, really. But somebody shared this last night. I'm not sure who it was. And you might be online, or you might be here. I don't know. But uh, say it again. Lisa Locklear. Lisa Locklear. I'm not sure if you're on, but thank you, Lisa. Okay, Psalm 23, verse 5. It says this. If you, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemy. First of all, like that, right, come on now. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. But then it goes on to say, <clears throat> and you honor me by anointing my head with oil. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. So can I read this to you? I don't know who the author is, but this is what it said. It said that sheep, which is us, we are the sheep. Sheep can get their head caught in, I think it's briars. Am I saying that right? Okay. And (laughs) die trying to get untangled. There are horrid little flies that like to torment the sheep by laying eggs in their nostrils, which turn into worms and drive the sheep to beat their head against a rock, oftentimes to death. Their ears and eyes are also susceptible to tormenting insects, so the shepherd anoints their whole head with oil. Then there is a peace. The oil forms a barrier, a protection, is this sounding familiar? A protection against the evil that tries to destroy the sheep. And then they ask this question, do you have times of mental torment? Do you, do you have these worrisome thoughts that invade your mind over and over again? Do you beat your head against a wall, a wall trying to, to stop them. God has an endless supply of oil that protects and makes it possible for you to fix your heart, fix your mind, fix your eyes on him today and always. There is peace in the valley. And then she goes on to say the faithfulness of God. But there's that oil again, right, that they put over, literally put over the sheep's head is that barrier, is that protection from the enemy. And how do we get the oil? By staying attached to the vine. It's the Holy Spirit's protection and provision and presence and power and peace in your life. And so as I, as I just start to close this up, uh, I love when you, I love those hearts. That's awesome. They're seeing us. So at least we know they're on. Okay. So going back to the beginning, we started at the Mount of Olives, right? Because Garden of Gethsemane is this olive press that we talked about. I found it so interesting that that olive press that Jesus went to, to die because he was going to be crushed and pressed to release, 
to give the Holy Spirit. He says, I can't give you the Holy Spirit till I die. So there's this pressing so we can receive the oil. But it's also the very location that he was ascended back to heaven. And as I thought about that, there's, there's a thought that I'm having, and I, I missed something, but it's okay. I will go back to another time. But in order to have the, the, the crushing, right, which goes first, the crushing has to precede the ascending. And so I want to just encourage you as we start to close this up with that thought for, for most of you here that are going through this. Like Isaiah 61, 3 says, to receive an oil of joy for your mourning. Oftentimes there's going to be a crushing, there's going to have to be a pressing in your life in order for you to get to the ascending part that we're all wanting, which is called the breakthrough. We talk about that a lot. All we want is the breakthrough. We sing about that at church, right? We, we want breakthroughs oftentimes. But in order for us to get to that breakthrough, God is saying, I first need to do some crushing. I first need to do some, some pressing. And it's a pruning. And that crushing and that pressing, it might feel like you're that camel that is being you know, bent down and having to give over. But that crushing and the pressing is happening so that it gets rid of the lies. It's pressing out the lies. It's pressing out the denial. It's pressing out the, the, the sin patterns. It's pressing out the anxiety. It's pressing out the worries. It's pressing out the frets. It's pressing out the trouble. It's pressing out the very things that are causing the discord in your own soul so that then you can have the ascension that you're all looking for. Because like, we oftentimes say it, and I'll probably say it in every message I have, you have to have the breakdown, right, to have the break open, to have the breakthrough, to break free. Amen. And in this time right now, as we go back to where we started, this pressing, this crushing that you might be experiencing right now as you came here this evening, could it just possibly be that it's because God's wanting to bring you to this ascension, wanting to bring you to this breakthrough? And I know that's sometimes a hard pill to swallow, but it's, it's, the, it's the pruning that God has to do in our life in order to give us the, the calling and the provision and, and the breakthrough that we're, we're desiring in our life. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, close it there. And uh, as we pray out, I want to just stay for a few minutes with you girls, talk a little bit more if that's okay. Do you have a few more minutes? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Nicole. After you sign off, I believe it in my heart I have to share something. Okay. You want to sign off first? Okay, let's pray. So, Father, I thank you for you. I thank you for your uh, Holy Spirit, Father God. I thank you, Father, for the just the, the visual tonight of what that Holy Spirit looks like. I thank you for the oil, for the anointing, Father God. I thank you that it's so simple. It's just coming to you as your daughter, as a little child, coming to her Papa God, coming to her Father, getting the comfort, giving, getting the provision, getting the protection, the presence of you, Father God. And so we just thank you for bringing us here to the, tonight to this place. I thank you for these precious women, Lord God. I pray in the name of Jesus right now they experience your presence. They experience your oil just from the top of their head to the bottom of their toe, this oil of joy that you share in your word being dumped on them, being poured over them, this love that's being administered into every corner and crevice of their dehydrated heart this evening. Father, I pray that tonight there's a word that you spoke to every single one of your children that is different from the woman next to her, Father God. And just right now, Lord, as we're praying, women, would you just take each other's hands just right now? I don't want one hand un untouched. Just, just grab each other's hand. And is you're feeling that woman's hand in your hand, be reminded that you're holding on to a survivor. You're holding on to a hand of a woman who is a miracle. Father, let us remember that always. How you see us. The plans that you have for us. That you are not a harsh Master, that we should take the talents, take the re spiritual resources that you have undeservingly given to us and hide them out of fear, out of lies from the enemy. 
In fact, that very fear that's causing us to not walk through that doorway of, of, of the vision you've given us is the very reason why we should, because the enemy is standing there with this ingredient of fear preventing us from walking through. So Father, give us the courage and the audacity to step right on through that because we have the oil, we have the sap, because we are attached to the vine. And when we are attached to the vine, we can do all things, all things, not just some things, but all things. So Father, would you fall fresh on this pavilion right now? Would you fall fresh into every woman holding each other's hand right now? The Father, that whatever it is that you have placed in our mind that you have calling in our life, I recognize that that's even still just way too small. Father, would you draw us back into your presence? Would you draw us back into your intimacy? Just draw us back into into being with you moment by moment by moment. We don't want to go one more minute after being here this evening without without being hanging by the vine, receiving that sap that nourishes our very soul. Father, I thank you for these precious women. I thank you for those birds that we're hearing right now. I thank you for the Holy Spirit oil that has just cloaked and covered us that we might not be able to see, but oh, do you see it? And so does the enemy. Keep us covered. Father, we love you. We praise you. We just thank you for loving us in this crazy, ridiculous, unfathomable, incomprehensible, boundless type of way. I pray every woman this evening, as she gets in her car, she would know the type of love, the depth of love, the breadth of love, the height and the width of this kind of crazy, undeserved love that you have ambushed us with forever and ever and ever. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' holy and perfect and mighty good name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to sign off. Thank you, ladies.